Hi again, in Kenneth Scott Latteretta, History of Christianity, chapter 12 now, we're taking up this, this, the story of the mon monophysites of Egypt, Nubia, and Ethiopia in the general heading, the smaller eastern churches. At this point, he says, we must now take up the chief of these churches one by one and say something of their history. At best, we can give them only brief mention. That is partly because the records of some of them are not available to us, but chiefly because, even as early as this period, that is around 950 AD, the mainstream of Christianity, as measured by inner vitality and the effect upon mankind as a whole, did not flow through them. We will begin in the southwest of the areas in which they were present and move northward and eastward. We have already had occasion to note the winning of the peoples of Egypt to Christianity. We have seen that the faith seems to seems first to have found rootage in Alexandria, in the Greek-speaking elements of that cosmopolitan Hellenistic city, and that the head of its Christian community became one of the chief patriarchs of the Catholic Church. We have noted that before the end of the 5th century, the faith became rooted among the native Egyptian stock, and in time was the dominant religion of the land. To facilitate the integration of the faith in the lives of the masses, the scriptures were translated and other Christian literature was prepared in the vernacular, and, and the services of the church were carried on in that tongue. We have remarked, too, that this Coptic population followed its leaders in refusing to accept the decisions of the Council of Chalcedon, that's the council of around 450 AD, and held to monophysite views of different Christology. Monophysites by no means entirely agreed among themselves, and their dissensions, theological and personal, troubled the Coptic Church, but opposition to the Chalcedonian theology was associated with nationalistic resistance to Byzantine rule, and in general only the minority, Greeks and those loyal to the emperor, held to the Catholic faith. On the eve of the Arab conquest, the imperial government represented by the Melkite patriarch was taking severe measures to suppress monophysitism. At the outset, the Arab victories brought relief to the Coptic Christians, for the latter were freed from persecution by Byzantine officials. The Arabs tolerated all the varieties of Christianity and prevented the Copts from taking vengeance on the Catholics. Under Arab rule, therefore, both Copts and Melkites continued. To be sure, Christians were placed under the disabilities, which we have already noted as general under the Muslim Arabs, including a discriminatory tax. Within a generation of the conquest, a large proportion of the Christian population, both Coptic and Melkite, went over to Islam. Yet Arabs employed many Christians in the government. They utilized Christian artists and architects. Indeed, what we often call Arab architecture seems to have been, at least in part, the creation of these Christian employees. As the years passed, Muslim restrictions on Christians were tightened. Early in the 8th century, additional financial burdens were placed on the Christians, and in that same century, persecutions were instituted, which led to the apostasy of many, even of several of the bishops, and which were countered by futile revolts that were sternly suppressed. By at least the 10th century, Christians were forbidden to attempt to convert Muslims, to marry Muslim women, to speak disparagingly of the Prophet or the Quran, to display crosses, to ring church bells, or in other ways to obtrude their faith on Muslims, to erect houses higher than those of Muslims, to ride thoroughbred horses, or to drink wine in public, or to allow swine to be seen, since both of these were abhorrent to good Muslims. Now and again, Christians won converts from Islam, but such defections from the dominant faith were usually visited with severe penalties. Yet Christianity persisted. Monasteries, of which Egypt had been the chief early center, continued and were the main strongholds of the faith. From them, as was general in the Eastern churches, the bishops were recruited. Although in their resistance to Islam, the churches tended to hold to the Coptic language in their services, even when Arabic became the vernacular of the masses, some Christian literature was prepared in the latter tongue. 
We have noted how from Egypt, beginning chiefly in the 6th century, the Christian faith spread southward into Nubia, roughly the present Sudan, and became very strong, apparently the prevailing faith in that region. Naturally, the dominant form of Nubian Christianity was that of Egypt, monophysite. We have also seen that Ethiopia, which we associate with the present Abyssinia, this is written, by the way, in the 1950s, had Christian con communities before the end of the 5th century. Early in the 6th century, an Ethiopian prince led an exp expedition in so to southwestern Arabia, which had a, as at least one of its objects the relief of Christians who were being persecuted by rulers of Jewish faith. In the 6th and 7th centuries, the Ethiopian church continued to prosper and was in close touch with the Coptic church and its mon monasteries. From the 7th to the 13th century, we know little of the history of Ethiopian Christianity. There were attacks by pagans and Muslim Arabs, and in the 10th century, a, a princess who was zealous for Judaism instituted a severe persecution. Yet the church lived on, obviously monophysite. Just a brief paragraph here on Syrian monophysites. We need add little to what we've what has already been said about monophysitism in Syria. Jacob Baradias was active in spreading it, but it did not owe its strength primarily to him. Syrian Jacobites traveled eastward as merchants and perhaps to escape persecution by the Catholic Byzantine rulers. Presumably they were the chief means of the wide extension of that form of the faith as a religion of some of the Christian minorities in Mesopotamia and east of that region. They had an ecclesiastical organization in Persia, but were not as numerous there as the Nestorians. The next time he takes up the Armenian Christians, and after that the Nestorians. I'll put in a link to a the track we did uh, some years ago, Slaves of Men. It's five characteristics of cultic groups. See you next time.